here for a moment, but really I'm not. I'm uh, pointing to a text that uh, Luke would like to refer to. It's in Corinthians. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, on television at the moment. It's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and it's from verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore I don't run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize. <laughs> Thanks, John. Well, good morning, church. It's, uh, it's great to be back here again today. Um, Jerry passes on her uh, apologies. She's uh, gone back out bush with the army again. Um, the second time in only a couple of weeks. So um, she was out for a month and uh, back for about two weeks and now she's gone out again. So she does send along her apologies. Um, it's a bit hard to get back here from Shoalwater Bay. So, um, but it is great to be back today. Uh, you noticed in the last couple of uh, times that I've come, I've shared with you about about faith without works and then courage, all about sparking us into action, to be people of action, not of good intention. And today I want to continue on with that theme. Today we'll be talking about keeping our eyes on the prize. Now, hopefully. So these are the Bible verses I'll be referring to this morning if you'd like to uh, follow along. So I opened up this morning, I want to tell you about a story of a young man. Back in the 1960s, there was a boy in high school named John Baker, who loved to run. In fact, it was said that he loved to run so much that his dream was to be on his high school track team. The only problem was his coach. The coach wasn't interested in John. He was too short and too slight to be a runner in the coach's opinion. John's friend was built like a runner. In fact, John's friend was such a promising runner that the, track's the, track, the, the track coach was in fact heavily recruiting him for the team. But that boy wasn't interested. And that was when John came up with a way to join the team. He basically promised the coach that if he'd let him run, he could convince his friend to join the team as well. So John, by virtue of this, got on the team. And in the team's first race, which was a 1.7 mile cross country event, a run through the hills of Albuquerque, of course there were a um, number of other schools and athletes there for the meet. And so there was the reigning champion, the reigning state champion runner, Lloyd Goff. And all eyes were on Goff. It seemed a foregone conclusion to everyone there that Goff would win, as he always had. So Lloyd led the pack as they disappeared over the hills. For the first few minutes, the spectators waited and watched, and then at last they saw a lone figure running towards them. Everyone assumed it was Lloyd Goff, but it wasn't. Guess who it was? John Baker. <laughs> That's right, it was John Baker who led the pack. He not only won the meet that day, but he in fact set a new meet record. When he was asked about how he was able to win, John said he asked himself a simple question. Am I doing my best? Then he fixed his eyes on the runner ahead of him until he passed him. And then the next and the next until there was no one left. Now how did John win that race? He won it by being focused. He focused on one runner at a time and he knew what he wanted to accomplish and he stayed on target until he crossed the finish line. In our text today, Paul declares 
Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly in 1 Corinthians 9.26. In other words, Paul had his eyes fixed on an objective. He had a goal and a purpose in mind. So my question to you this morning is, what is your goal as a Christian? What do you want to do for Jesus? What are you shooting for for God? Now for some folks, getting to church on time on a Sunday morning is a big priority. Let me tell you, I appreciate that, because if you didn't show up on Sunday mornings, I'd have no one to preach to. And that would be rather depressing for me, so I'm glad you're here. But if that's all that we expect to do as Christians, we've missed the mark. And we miss it big time. Because too many Christians remind me, this might sound like a funny analogy, of the London bus company. And let me tell you why that is. Because several years ago, that transit company was striving for efficiency. And they made it their goal to always be on schedule. It sounds like a pretty good aim, doesn't it? For a bus company to always be on schedule. However, no bus route in any other community seemed to even rival their efficiency. Which sounds great, doesn't it? Until you realise how they did it. How did they manage to keep such a tight schedule in such a busy part of the world? Well, it seems that if they're in danger of getting behind the schedule, their drivers were instructed simply not to stop at bus stops. <laughs> even when there were people waiting there for the bus. As you can imagine, that made some customers fairly angry. But the London, the London Transit Authority released this statement to explain why they didn't always pick up waiting passengers at the bus stops. They said, it is impossible for us to maintain our schedules if we're always having to, pick, having to stop and pick up passengers. Now, there's something wrong with this picture, isn't there? That's right, a bus company does not exist in order to meet a schedule, does it? The purpose of the bus company is to pick up and drop them off. In the same way our purpose as Christians is to pick up people and drop them off at the feet of Jesus, isn't it? Pretty simple. See, before Jesus left earth and returned to heaven, he gave the church our marching orders. He says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. In Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. See, that's our objective. Our objective is to win people, to baptise them into Christ and to teach them to obey what Christ wants of them. That's why we exist as a church, isn't it? Yep. It's just part of the deal that we together at worship, in Sunday school classes, in home, in home Bible studies, etc. And our principal objective in doing this is so we can learn to make disciples, to baptise them and to teach them about Jesus. And if we're not doing that, we've missed the point. So the question becomes, how do we do that then? How do we go about making disciples and baptising them and teaching them? In our text this morning, again, Paul writes, I do not fight like a boxer beating the air, in 1 Corinthians 26. Now when I read that, I got to thinking that Paul was referring to something that is now called shadow boxing. Anyone familiar with shadow boxing? It's what boxers do. They shadow box. When a boxer is all by himself, beating the air, he's throwing punches against an imaginary opponent. It's a visualisation thing. He pictures in his mind what he's going to do in the ring. He knows his opponent's weaknesses and his strength, and he's going through a series of jabs and left hooks that might penetrate the other guy's defences. But now once he gets in the ring, he's got to stop imagining how he's going to fight and actually start throwing some punches, doesn't he? 
because what he does in that ring is beat the air or shadow box. He's going to come out of that ring on a stretcher, isn't he? You see, church, Sunday school, Bible studies and such, to a degree that's all shadow boxing. Now don't get me wrong, it's vitally important for our spiritual nourishment. But it's also practice in a sense, isn't it? That we get together to imagine what we can say to someone who doesn't know Jesus. We get together to visualise how we can get through people's defences. And as Peter put it, this is where we should be imagining how we can serve Christ. In his words, he's recorded the saying, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who gives you, who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. In 1 Peter 3.15. See, this is where we train. Worship, Sunday school, Bible study. But once we leave the training, then we're in the game, aren't we? We're in the ring. We're on the track. Whatever you want to call it. We train here for the real stuff out there. The making of disciples. Now I recently read about a guy who never had any interest in running. The whole idea of getting into jogging clothes and taking a run just bored him to tears. Then his wife tried talking to him into joining her in a five kilometre marathon. Did I mention he didn't like running? He hated it. But he started running because it was important to her and because he loved her. What amazed him though, was what happened to him once he began to run alongside other people. When that other person passed him, it bugged him. Even though it was a friendly competition, he had no intention of letting anyone pass him. And his competitive juices began to flow. And he began to gauge himself against others and it made him strive to do better. <coughs> In another illustration, I read about a pastor that recounted this story. He says, the first church that I served, I was teaching an adult Sunday school class. Max and Paul were there and we were talking about inviting people to church. Paul turned to Max and said, I'll invite 10 people to church this week and I dare you to do the same. Max smiled and said he could do anything that Paul could do and more. Now ask yourself, why would they do that? Anybody have any ideas? Because they're guys. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's one of them, Karen. Yeah. See, they didn't do it for money or trophies, but they did it because there's something about a friendly contest, isn't it? That makes people strive to do better. Now, maybe there might be someone who thrives in a challenge. And maybe you can engage in a bit of personal competition to bring out your best as well. The point is, though, is that we train we challenge and then we do something about it. But how do we know what we're supposed to do? How do we get people to come to church to hear the good news? See, as a church, we can have many kinds of community outreaches. You can host free lunches. You can have a food pantry, a baby ministry, a reach out to families who have lost possessions. You can host a financial seminar have a table tennis night, or put on a marriage retreat. These are just some of the ways that we as a church can do something to tell our community that we care about them and their families. But what can you do as an individual? How can you get people interested? Now, I got to thinking about that and it occurred to me that when you all started coming to church, what was it made you that decided to come that you're going to take Jesus seriously in your life. Let's see a raising of hands. How many of you started to come to church because your parents brought you? Yeah, quite a lot of you. Was it a sign out the front? No? Had you heard about the handsome preacher that we had? I want to think there's a lot of hands go up today. <laughs> but the reputation of the church, perhaps that it had in the community. Was it through a Bible study or had someone simply invited you? I was hoping for more hands for the handsome preacher, but never mind. 
So there's some interesting results. And a couple of years ago, a religious group in the United States surveyed non-church people about what kinds of invitations would get them to come to church. And this is what the results were. 18% of people surveyed said that a Facebook ad would be, would be key for them to come in. 21% said a church member knocking on their door might encourage them to come. 23% said a TV commercial. 23% said perhaps a postcard. But 51%, over half, through a personal invitation from a friend or family member. Now notice the indirect methods would be useful to a sense. These, first, these unchurched folks said that if they saw a Facebook ad or received a postcard in the mail, that maybe they'd come. And they even thought cold calling might be useful, you know, the knocking on people's doors. But over half of those surveyed said that a personal invitation from someone they knew would be the most persuasive method. Elsewhere I also read of something where one survey said that a number of folks said they would consider going to church if someone they knew were to ask them. But nobody had ever asked them. How sad is that? It's something that we can all do. In another illustration, back in 2001, there was a man by the name of Larry Pierce. And he came to church for the first time. It was in early January, this is in the United States. And there was a fairly bad snowstorm that day. But there stood Larry, Larry in a body cast and on crutches coming to church for the first time. You might say, why was he there, particularly in that state? Well, he'd been in a car wreck a month or so before, and the rescue crew that had cut him out of his vehicle said he had no business, li no business living through that crash. That day he made a promise that the first day he could get on his feet, he was going to church. Now that explains how he started going to church. But why this particular church that he attended? Well, for years he had a friend here named Jim at that church who would repeatedly say, hey Larry, you coming to church this Sunday? And Larry would always make some lame excuse and never show. Until, that is, that January Sunday, in a snowstorm and in a body cast and on crutches when he realised he needed Jesus more than anything else. <coughs> through personal invitations, what got into that church. Has anyone heard of something called a hansom? I'm not talking about myself. <laughs> it's actually something called a hansom cab, which back in the 1800s, that was what it looked like. Now, what about if you're somebody that doesn't know how to talk to folks? You're not a particularly extroverted person. What if you consider yourself socially inept? Well, I read of a true story about a man in the 1800s who didn't think he knew enough to talk to people about Christ. That's probably true of a few of us, isn't it? So he'd hire a handsome or horse and buggy to get him to drive him to revivals. Then he'd pay the driver to go inside to the revival and he'd stay outside with the buggy and take care of the horse. The whole point is to do whatever you have to do to introduce people to Jesus. To do whatever you have to do as a church. To do it because you love Jesus so much that you'll find a way to reach out to others. Anybody heard of this guy? Eddie Stanky? Not very good names. <laughs> Replace my letter, it's not very good at all. But back in the 1940s, there was a second baseman named Eddie Stanky. And they and he it was said that he barreled his way through 11 seasons for National League teams. That's professional baseball in the United States. He played for some big teams, including the champion Brooklyn Dodgers, the Boston Braves, and the New York Giants. But apparently he wasn't a very natural baseball player. In fact, I think it was one of his managers remarked, he didn't have the talent you'd expect of a professional baseball player. One of his managers said, he can't run, 
He can't hit and he can't throw. But if there's a way to beat the other team, he'll find it. And that was recorded as in Time magazine in 1999. See, that's the kind of person that Jesus is looking for. Jesus isn't looking for a polished preacher or a talented teacher. He's looking for someone who will find whatever way they can to win people for Jesus. Now, I want to close by telling you a story of Robert Reed. Has anyone heard of Robert Reed? See, Robert Reed is someone that can't run. He can't box. He can't take part in any physical contest. His hands are twisted. His feet are useless. He can't bathe himself. He can't feed himself. He can't brush his teeth, comb his hair, or even put on his underwear. His shirts are held together by strips of Velcro. And he has trouble speaking clearly. Robert has cerebral palsy. And his disease keeps him from driving a car, riding a bike, going for a walk. But it didn't keep him from graduating from high school or attending Abilene Christian University. And cerebral palsy didn't keep him from teaching at St. Louis Junior College or from venturing over his on five mission trips. And Robert's disease didn't keep him from becoming a missionary to Portugal. He moved to Lisbon alone in 1972. There he rented a hotel room and began studying Portuguese. He didn't even know the language at the point that he moved. He found a restaurant owner who would feed him after the rush hour and a tutor who would instruct him in the language. Then he stationed himself daily in a park where he distributed brochures about Christ. Within six years, he had led 70 people to the Lord. How did he do that? Robert did that by keeping his eye on the prize. He wasn't going to let what he couldn't do stop him from doing what he could do for Jesus, of whom he loved. I want to simply leave you with a question this morning. As a Christian, are your eyes on the prize? I pray that they are and that you'll do all that you can to do lead others to Christ and tell them about the hope that we have. God bless.